Well, good evening and welcome to the Vice Admiral Lawrence Ethics Essay Dinner. My name is Colonel Art Athens. I have the honor of serving as the Naval Academy's director of the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. And your presence this evening is a, is a testament to the Naval Academy's commitment to developing and graduating leaders who make courageous ethical decisions. So our opportunity tonight is to celebrate, to fellowship, but also remind ourselves of how important honesty, integrity, and ethics truly is as we lead others. It is now my distinct privilege to introduce the 61st Superintendent of the Naval Academy. Vice Admiral Miller is a graduate of the class of 1974 and has served and contributed to our Navy and nation in many high profile and demanding assignments. Those include Commander Carrier Strike Group 7, the first active duty director of the White House Military Office, the commanding officer of the USS John F. Kennedy, the commanding officer of the USS Coronado, and a squadron commander during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Prior to coming here to the Academy, Admiral Miller was the Navy's Chief of Legislative Affairs. As the superintendent, Admiral Miller has brought energy, enthusiasm to really set us on an impressive trajectory here at the Naval Academy. So please join me in welcoming Admiral Miller and his wife, Barbara, who accompanies him tonight. Well, what a pleasure. I always, uh, always love listening to Colonel Athens talk. I, you know, of course, as he describes me, one would have to consider whether there might be a couple of ethical violations there. Uh, but I will take him at his word. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it is great to be here with, uh, with so many distinguished guests. And I, I look around, you know, having been here now for two years, I have had the pleasure of spending time with virtually all of you. At one point in time or another, we've shared a story, a, a drink, a glass of wine, or maybe just uh, a discussion about where this school is headed. And tonight, we celebrate the fact that we're headed, in my view, in our view, in the right direction. The moral element of our mission is clearly one of the, is without doubt, is the most important part of this three-legged stool. And we always talk about moral, mental, and physical. Uh, but we have some wonderful examples here tonight. In addition to the Admiralty, I see Hank and Jamie's here and Bill's here and I think Rob Riley's here someplace. I mean, we've got tremendous leadership that's, uh, that is here to honor our midshipmen tonight. But of course, we celebrate the name Lawrence. And my dear friend, Diane Lawrence and, uh, and Dr. Lori Lawrence and uh, we'll pimp Wendy Lawrence, class of 81, who is not here tonight. Uh, but for their contributions, uh, both while Diane was in the house in which we are privileged to rent right now, uh, her, that, that leadership that was so profoundly on display is something that we still celebrate to this very day. Uh, Admiral Lawrence, of course, was much more than just the superintendent. He was a tremendous aviator. He was a very strong and courageous POW. He was a a wonderful poet. And so we celebrate this essay in his honor, in our honor, the honor that he brought to this school. I want to specifically thank General John Sattler for being our distinguished uh, guest keynote speaker tonight. Uh, for those of you that have not met General Sattler, I will tell you that uh, you cannot you cannot have kind of a lazy day when General John Sattler is up moving around because he has the energy of uh, 10 of us. Uh, I also want to thank the class of 81. Could I ask those members of the class of 81 that are here tonight, today, tonight would you stand up please and be recognized? Where are you? There we are. Thank you. You know, as I go around the country and talk about the Naval Academy, I talk about the edge of excellence. The sword is actually provided to us by the taxpayers. The lights stay on, the professors are paid, uh, but the real, the defining elements of this educational experience is in so many ways reflected in just this philanthropy, this generosity that the class of 81 represents in this very dinner. I, uh, I'm reminded that we just this past year commissioned DDG uh, 110 
the William P. Lawrence, but it is not the first USS Lawrence that we have had. This Lawrence has as a motto, uh, never give in. Uh, and if that doesn't resonate with us here, I would tell you that, that we have become deaf. But it also reminds me of some other famous sayings that we celebrate here, and that includes another USS Lawrence. It was commanded by Oliver Hazard Perry 199 years ago to this very day when he ran the British from Lake Erie, and in doing so, sealed the borders and essentially ensured that we would win the, the War of 1812. We didn't know it right then, but it was in the honor of his very dear friend, Captain uh, James Lawrence, who of course, when he, was, when he was in battle with the HMS Shannon, was mortally wounded and said those famous words, fight her till she sinks and don't give up the ship. It's, we might just be a little bit familiar with that. It's the centerpiece of our memorial hall. It is one of the most prized possessions in our museum. It is something that people around the world come to see because it is who we are. Don't give up the ship. So afterwards, of course, what does, what does the, the famous then Oliver Hazard Perry send? But he goes back to the president and he says, we have met the enemy and they are ours. This moral mission, this calling, to defend the nation is so very important to us and we celebrate tonight this honorable profession and the foundation which of course is trust. Without trust, no one will follow. I'm so very proud of those that teach this ethical foundation and so if I could, uh, if all of the instructors of any 203 ethics and moral reasoning for the naval officer, if they would please stand and be acknowledged. Thank you very much. Tonight we honor our award winners and our finalists. We have some of the, for, I know that not everybody gets to see the essays. I have gotten to see some and I, you can't help but come away with how impressive the thought, the depth of reasoning that goes behind their positions. And that's exactly what this should be. It's not about getting all the answers to the exam, it's about getting the questions. And if you get the right questions, the answers, in turn, will come over a broad spectrum of naval leadership. Everything from just war theory to ethics of robotics. These are things that our future leaders will face. Emerging nations, new political philosophies, sophisticated technologies like cyber warfare, these will all test our midshipmen and their sense of right and wrong. Literally, that book has yet to be written. So. I would tell you that uh, for our midshipmen, we celebrate your presence here tonight. We are so excited about your future and all that you have done to bring yourself this far. I hope that uh, as, we, as we talk about your accomplishments tonight, that we remind ourselves that this is but the first on a voyage of discovery. And I am so grateful that we can all be here to share tonight. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Admiral Miller. Great words, great historical lesson as well that we can use in our, our lives as we think about that flag that is up in Memorial Hall. I want to add my thank you to the class of 1981. I'm from the class of 1978, so there's a special love relationship, <laughs> at least from my direction towards 81. I'm not sure the other, the other way. But if there is a member of the class of 81 who tells some erroneous story about me bracing them up or yelling at them, it just isn't true. But we do thank you, Class of 81, for what you do to enable this dinner to, uh, to, to be uh, held. Uh, before I introduce our, our guest speaker, uh, I would like to introduce a, a couple of people. Now, this is always very difficult when we have a prestigious audience like we have, because everybody deserves to be introduced and recognized, but it would cut into General Sattler's uh, speaking time, so I'm not going to do that. And, uh, <laughs> and instead, uh, instead, there's just a couple of, of folks that I'm going to introduce. Uh, we, have a, we have a number of members of the senior leadership team, Admiral Miller's uh, senior leadership team. And I think what this represents is 
the commitment that the entire academy has towards ethical leadership, that, it, that it's not just in one little area here at the academy, it's, it's truly across the board. So I'm, I'm going to ask each member of the SLT who's here to stand up and turn as I, as I recognize you, and then we can, well, I don't know if you want to clap for the senior leadership team, but if you, but if you do, uh, we, can do that at the, uh, we can do that at the end. Captain Steve Vossen, uh, the, the chief of staff, and his wife Wendy are, are here. Captain Bob Clark, the Commandant, and his wife, uh, Ruth Ann. Dean Andy Phillips, who's the Academic Dean. I know I saw, there's Andy. Uh, Chet Gladchuk is, there he is right there under my nose, the Director of Athletics. Thanks for being here, Chet. Dean Bruce Latta, the Dean of Admissions, and his wife, Debbie. And uh, Captain Roger Isom, the Chief Diversity Officer. And the Command Master Chief, John Taylor, and his wife, Lauren. And if you want to give them a, a hand. <clears throat> now, I, I just got to tell you, they all do tremendous work, but there's someone in that group that really works behind the scenes, and I've just seen the impact that he's had on the Naval Academy, and I'm going to embarrass Steve Voss and the, the Chief of Staff. His agenda is so diverse and wide, and he takes care of all of us, and even a dinner like this somehow wouldn't happen unless Steve did what he does. So, Steve, I personally thank you for, uh, for what you do. We're also honored to have uh, Mr. Byron Marchant, the President and CEO of the Alumni Association and Foundation, right there, Byron. He, <clears throat> he's also a Class of 78 guy, but if you all have at your table a, a, a story about him from the Class of 81, it's probably true. So, <laughs> I can't defend uh, Byron. And finally, she's already been introduced, but uh, I just want to recognize Mrs. Lawrence again and the Lawrence's daughter, Lori, who's come from Vanderbilt Medical Center where, uh, where she teaches and serves in the emergency uh, room in the pediatric side, and we're thrilled to have you. And Mrs. Lawrence always adds grace and dignity to our, to our dinner. And as I was uh, driving in this morning, I was just remembering the uh, tremendous example Admiral and Mrs. Lawrence set modeling a marriage based on love and devotion and sacrifice. So we are so grateful that you could be with us again tonight, Mrs. Lawrence and Lori. And it is truly my honor now to introduce the, the guest speaker. Uh, I consider this man a leader a warrior, a strategist, a mentor, and someone who's contributed an awful lot to the Naval Academy in one short year while he's been serving as the Distinguished Chair of Leadership here at the Naval Academy. General John Sattler uh, spent 37 years in the Marine Corps, uh, and, uh, and during that time he commanded all units from platoon all the way up to a Marine Expeditionary Force. And I must point out that he led one MEF, and being a Marine, this is, uh, you know, true to my heart and soul, uh, led them in combat in Iraq in an, in an extraordinary and, and courageous way. Uh, his final assignment in the Marine Corps before he retired in August of 2008 uh, was as the, uh, as the director of uh, strategic plans and policy on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the J-5, which means basically you take care of the world, and uh, General Sattler had to do that. But on a personal note, I have to tell you that my office and his are adjacent to each other. So I've had the opportunity to continue to learn about ethical leadership, compassionate leadership, unwavering integrity during this year period, because I never had the, the opportunity to work for General Sattler. I've learned about those things from someone who understands them and absolutely exemplifies them. And, and he is a great addition to the Naval Academy family. But before I bring him up, I also want to recognize his wife, Ginny. Because the one thing I do know about General Sattler is he's been deployed a lot over those 37 years. And even today, he continues to serve going out to the operating forces, preparing them for the challenges that they have, so he's still traveling a lot. And I just want to honor Mrs. Sattler for her sacrifices over the years.
And now please join me in welcoming the distinguished chair of leadership of the Naval Academy, Lieutenant General John Sattler, United States Marine Corps retired. And not an IT wonder. We'll see if we can get this thing on. Hello. Okay, we have it. I just, uh, <clears throat> I'm also one of those individuals who can't stand behind a podium uh, very long, kind of want to shift back and forth, like to make eye contact. But this, uh, this last year, working side by side with Colonel Art Athens, and, uh, and thanks to the, the trust and the gamble of our superintendent to, to bring a Marine in into the uh, Stockdale Center as the leadership chair, it has been a, an, an unbelievable opportunity for for both myself and my wife, Jenny. And the reason why it's been a phenomenal opportunity is one of the reasons why we're here tonight. It's, uh, it's to talk about the midshipmen and, uh, and those three cylinders of excellence, the mental, the moral, and the physical, that uh, the superintendent keeps those level. Because you don't want somebody to be King Kong in one and a chipmunk in another. Because that's not, that's not what the operating forces are waiting for, and that's definitely not what sailors and Marines who may go into harm's way at a moment's notice, uh, deserve to have. So I, I could not be more excited about the curriculum and the changes that have been made since, uh, since I graduated back in 1971. And my old company mate, Steve Brighton, and his wife, Susan, uh, sitting right there to attest to it. We in no way, shape, or form had an assignment to write papers like, the, like these midshipmen, the third class midshipmen had last year. Some of the topics of those tables, taking a look at ethical and moral decisions through, through, the, through the just war theory and arguing and debating points back and forth on topics like a preemptive strike on Iran. Think about that. A preemptive strike on Iran as a, as a youngster, doing the research and coming up with your reasoning and thoughts. Is it ethical? Is it moral? Does it come in line with the just war theory? The utilization of contractors in a combat zone, not just as logisticians and driving vehicles, but as paid security guards slash mercenaries. What are the ethical challenges? How does, that, how does that stack up? Cyber warfare, computer network attack, destroying computers en route to get to, hopefully, the enemy that initiated the attack. A lot of research, a lot of time going into that to develop all this. And lastly, one of the winners, taking a look at the uh, Libya campaign, and NATO's involvement in Libya as you take that against the, uh, the just war theory. Is it ethical, moral, and is it just for NATO to have become involved, to have picked sides in that Libyan campaign? I still remember I did a paper, did a paper for English, Youngster Year. And I, I was looking at these papers because I, I had the opportunity. They gave me three... I guess they gave me four weeks to read 10 papers. I finished the last two in an all-nighter last night. So it gives you, <laughs> gives you an idea of, uh, Dean, I was, uh, that was my weak cylinder. I was a chipmunk in there. But, but I'm working on it now. I'm trying hard. But I wrote, I wrote a paper, which I mailed home to my mother to type. I still remember it. And it was pretty, uh, we didn't have uh, computers then. We had a slide rule. And I tried like hell, but you could not type on that thing. So. I mailed it home to her. The title of the paper was Sin and Its Effects in the Scarlet Letter. Okay, just war theory, preemptive strike on Iran, you know, Nathaniel Hawthorne and Hester Prynne in the Scarlet Letter. I, I think, as you said, Admiral, we're coming. We are moving out smartly in the right direction. <laughs> By the way, uh, Dean, my, my mother got a B on the paper. <laughs> But as, uh, <laughs> as both the superintendent and Colonel Athens have stated, uh, our, our sole purpose here, the only reason that this leadership factory or laboratory exists is to, to train men and women, young men and women, to make ethical and moral decisions in the most onerous conditions that uh, anyone in the world can face, and that's known as combat. If you can look at a decision and make it in a combat situation when life, limb, and eyesight are on the line, then, uh, then this institution continues to do a great, great job. And I thought what I'd do is just give you a, highlight a couple of situations 
that, uh, that we came into or ran across. Well, one I'd like to start back when I was the second lieutenant. Coming out of here, out of the academy, we did not have the leadership department back in those days. And, and Steve knows it, and Admiral Mel, you remember it too. Your leadership came through osmosis. You had a good company officer, you had a good officer rep. If you played, had the opportunity to play a sport, you now had a role model. Somebody you could focus and home in on, and you could want to be like. It was, it was a mentor before the term was as uh, mentioned like it is on a daily basis today. Uh, I was fortunate enough that uh, you know, I was a mediocre wrestler I was here, but we had an officer rep. We had a phenomenal coach who had a backbone that would not waver, Coach Ed Peary. I know, Chet, you've had the, had the chance to meet him. He was already retired when you got here, but just a phenomenal human being. It wasn't all about wrestling. At the end of the practices, we would sit down, and he would talk about his wrestlers who were in Vietnam, who were flying off carrier battle groups, who were on the gun line firing naval gunfire as surface warfare officers. He talked about that to his wrestling team because that was his pride. The letters that came back, he felt he was successful if those ensigns and those second lieutenants were successful and they continued to be that way as they moved up through the rank, a leadership factory. But again, it was, it was chance. Our officer rep was a little feisty Marine captain whose name was Chuck Krulak. And <laughs> Nobody knew it at that point in time, later to be the Commandant of the Marine Corps. I'm sorry, I'm shortening him. He was about that tall. <laughs> just, just in case, you know, maybe, just in case, uh, he's everywhere. I know he's watching, but... <laughs> uh, king, of, king of suck up here, too. I did learn that. But, uh, so, but by virtue of having that kind of a leader, we got now, which is institutionalized in the, in the, uh, in the leadership and ethics department with the law of armed conflict, all of the courses that, that the midshipmen are exposed to and the dedicated, passionate instruction. Plus, the company officers are a lot more engaged now. They're trained. The battalion officers are. They understand that they have a, an unbelievable responsibility to add to. Bancroft Hall, the athletic department, the academic department, all working as one to turn out the best possible leader of warriors that the institution can. Uh, one, we were, um, <clears throat> we, were in, we were actually in Iraq and we were clearing a target. Uh, we had watched this target in the city of Fallujah, the special operators had come in. We had the target folder built. Two o'clock in the morning, all the pattern of life is met. The vehicles are moving in, the guards are posted. The meeting is going down. And these are some fairly onerous individuals that we wanted to get out of the gene pool. We wanted them out of the gene pool before the battle started because this was some of their charismatic leadership. So we tracked them, we monitored them, and it all came together one night. They were on a rooftop, two o'clock in the morning. And for those of you ethically, uh, we, when we strike a target, and a deliberate target strike, meaning not troops in contact, you're shooting at me, I have the inherent right to self-defense, the rules change dramatically. But if you are on the top of a building and there's no hostile fire coming out, the ethical decision to strike that target rests with a commander and the staff around that commander doing a number of things. First thing they do is they check collateral damage. They look at the heading of the aircraft, how big the bomb, the delay of the fuse, quick, quick fuse, delayed fuse, 500 pounder, 2,000 pounder, heading towards the soccer field, heading towards the schoolyard of the mosque. All that goes into the computations while, while you're getting ready to strike the target. The next thing is deconfliction of friendly forces. We didn't have that problem in Fallujah. We couldn't go into town. It was just two owners. The next point is you have to declare, they have to be declared hostile. Either hostile intent, they're about to do something to you, or by virtue of the pattern of life, you've walked the dog all the way through, in this case with the special operators, we knew these were bad, bad people. And then when that's all done, then the commander can go ahead and strike the target. Everything came together, viable target, high value target, big leaders. It, this was gonna be something that would really facilitate the attack coming on in about 10 days. So what happens? We clear the target, still remember sitting there, everything came together, turned to the operations officer. I mean, you could hear the, uh, you could hear that was an F-18 off the carrier. You could hear, oh, you know, you know Roger, uh, be advised, uh, you know, two minutes fuel left. What are you guys going to do down there? I mean, the pilot's up there. He, he, you got to tell me, I got to go to the tanker. 
So we looked at everybody and said, clear the target. So wings level, clear hot. You can, you know, everybody's watching because we're watching through a predator. You can see the building, you can see the guys on it. We're going to take them out. In a split second before the F-18 drops the bomb, in the building next door, the door flies open, and seven little kids, I have no idea what they were doing in there, seven kids at 2 in the morning run out in the backyard of the building, which is the wall is adjacent to the one we're striking. And everybody in the command post, we're all looking at it, and we go, wow. No, we, we went a little stronger than wow. But, uh, <laughs> and I turned it. <laughs> I turned to the radio up, you know, on the guy, I said, abort, abort the, you know, and, and I, I thought there's no way in hell we're going to be able to abort the mission. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, the pilot comes back on, he says, Roger, uh, saw those kids come out, uh, made, a, uh, made a call on my own that uh, didn't think you want to do that, uh, we can strike this target another time. I said, this is a young pilot, you know, probably a, probably a, a lieutenant or probably a Navy lieutenant off the carrier. Just made the ethical decision at that point in time, did, did he start? To make that ethical decision when he got in the aircraft before he launched off the carrier? No. Did he to start to make the ethical decision when the kids ran out and he's got a three-star general telling him, strike this target, it's a big one and we've been waiting for it for a long time? No. That ethical decision making started back when he was writing papers probably at the United States Naval Academy or in an ROTC unit somewhere. So ethical decision making, moral judgment is not something you can pull an all-nighter on. It's something that is a learned behavior. It's something that makes your stomach burn when you know you're about to do something that's not right. And it makes your heart pound and the adrenaline flow when you know everything's, everything's right, it's got to be done, and if not, me who? And those are ethical type decisions that, uh, that these young men and women are learning through the great instruction here at the U.S. Naval Academy. One, one last one. Uh, I was the uh, director of operations before I went into Iraq with the, with the MEF, working out a cutter with the then General Abizade was the Central Command Commander. It's General Mattis now. General Abizade had the entire war theater inside Iraq. He had all of Afghanistan, and we had the Horn of Africa, all cleared by men and women sitting in two back double-wide trailers in, a, in the country of Qatar. Get woken up in the morning, about 2 o'clock, things, nothing... <laughs> No one ever wakes you up in the morning to brief you on a target that they don't want you to kill. I, I learned that real fast. It's like you, you get in there and, oh, everybody's all fired up. Sir, we got a good one here. You know, and, and, uh, in this case, General Abizade had the authority to strike it, and he had delegated it to his OPSO, and I, I was the operations officer. I get in there, and the special operators had gone up and chased these individuals. This is the SOCOM crew. This is Joe McChrystal's guys. Crazy, chased them all the way up to the Pakistani border, the rules of engagement said if you had continuous, uninterrupted, a hot pursuit, meaning you fired at me and I, I went after you, and either through a gun pod of an F-18 or an F-16 or a Predator overhead, we never lost contact. Basically, had you by the belt all the way till you got to where you got to. That was continuous, uninterrupted. If you ran into the woods, somebody came out the other side, I lost sight of you in here, did not meet morally and ethically did not meet the rules of engagement. Okay, so fast forward. We're in, you know, come, come walking in, what do we got? So the soft guys, Special Operations Force, soft guys are on the line. They got the guys who have been rocketing their compound, but they're, they're eight kilometers inside of Pakistan. They chased them in inside. The rule was 10. 10 was the limit. Uh, you know, Musharraf never signed up for that, but that's what the SECDEF and the President gave us. You could hot pursuit up to 10 kilometers and and then you were, you were okay legally. But just because it's legal doesn't mean it's moral ethical. Okay, so they're there. And they're actually, they got an AC-130 gunship turning, and, and, and the decision has to be made. And, you know, and you're the, you're the individual. And there will be many decisions, and people in this, folks in this room have made these kinds of tough decisions. And, and they come on, and they're all, oh, we got them. We got to take them out. You know, just give us the word. And, uh, and you know, you're saying, I'm going, did you have continuous uninterrupted, hot pursuit to the point where you have them right now. Silence on the other side. And, they, and then one of the soft guys comes back and goes, sir, this has got to be them. There's no other place the bastards could have gone. And I said, I'm asking you again. Did you have continuous, uninterrupted, hot pursuit? I want a yes or no answer. But they, no, I don't want any buts. I want a yes or no. And uh, you know, it gets real quiet and you can hear them. I mean, I could almost hear them going, buck, 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 
buck. Here's the here's the chicken at higher headquarters. He's not getting rocketed. We are. He's in Qatar. We're in Afghanistan. We know these are the guys that rocketed us. We lost two guys wounded three days ago. They're back at us again. We can we can deal the death hand to them right here. If only that if this you know this individual will only give us the go. Uh, finally, I just said you disappoint me. Disappoint me. You know the rules of engagement as well as I do. If we start to modify the rules of engagement and make our own up, we become another brand of thugs. And the people that are caught in the middle, in this case the Pakistanis or the Afghanis, whoever it was that went back across the border, the, the border, have to decide between which is the least of two evils. That's not America. That's not what we stand for. So I denied the target. You know, turned, sent the AC 130 back. Went back that night, dry heaved, threw up got sick. You know, I mean, lonely world. You know, did I make the right call? Did I not make the right call? As one of them said, well, we're going to get rocketed again tomorrow. I can see that now. You know, not into the radio, but in the background, basically saying, because you didn't have the guts to take this out, we'll get rocketed again. So I kind of lived with that for, this was like 2000 and, um, 2003, late 2003. I'm now, I'm retired, so it's like 2009. I'm at Capstone, down at, uh, down at, down at uh, Joint Forces Command, all the brand new one stars from all the services go to Capstone. When you go to Capstone, you Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, all the brand new one stars get a chance to learn the cultures of each other's service. When you come down to Joint Forces Command, there was a group of us that gave them one week on war fighting. And you know, war fighting, tactics, doctrine, planning, all the things, strategic communications. We're at the break on the second day. This is probably I don't know if you look at the time, it's probably six, probably seven years after that night. Up comes this young, now one star. And he said, sir, you remember me? And I did. I did remember because he was a dynamo because he would travel with General McChrystal on occasion. And I said, yeah, I do remember you. How are you doing? He goes, great, sir. He goes, let me tell you something. Do you remember the night that we chased those bad guys across the border into Pakistan? And I said, his first name's Tony. I won't. I said, Tony, yeah, I yeah, remember it. Hell, you know how much sleep I've lost over that over the years? He said to me, you know what? You know what we learned that night? We all got a lesson that night in ethical and moral courage, standing tall in the face of, a, of an alien force, i.e. special operators, who want to do justice to these guys. And you were the conventional guy. I'm not a special operator. The only thing that stood between us and dealing out justice was you. He said, you know what, sir? We were wrong. You know, and this is just two of us talking off the side. And I said, Tony, where the hell have you been for six years? I mean, <laughs> I mean, where have you been? But uh, I, I, I carried that with me. I just like everybody in this room carries a decision somewhere along the way. In this case, life, limb, eyesight was on the line. But my moral compass, based on the people I had come in contact with, folks like General Krulak, who had, who, had a, who had a moral compass that was just pegged just straight north. I think it was painted. I don't think it was on, a, on, a, on any kind of a lever. But, the, but because of those individuals, I believe I made the right decision. And I think if I had not had that, if I had not had the instruction that, that, that is, is provided now here at the United States Naval Academy across the four years you're here, uh, I think that, that that is the most important thing that we inculcate and the men and women to become ensigns and second lieutenants when they graduate. So in, in closing, I will say I had the opportunity to read the 10 papers. Uh, my last uh, tour, as uh, Colonel Athens says, was in, on the joint staff as the J-5, a strategy and policy guy, which means you go to the White House and sit in the National Security Council representing the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, sometimes five meetings a day, from everything from Libya to Iraq to the Sudan, to the Korean nuclear reactor. It's all over the, all over the, all over the, the spectrum. But they also give you 250, and Jamie, you know this, they give you 250 of the brightest men and women in the world who write papers and come up with this, the thorough arguments like I saw in the 10 papers I read to come down to the final two. Uh, so the training, the opportunity that you're having right now, and keeping in mind there were over 1,200 papers written, 1,200 papers written by the, by the youngsters last year to get down to those 10 finalists to come up with the two winning papers. But the, back to what, what, what Admiral Miller said, the rigor that went into it, 
the, the thought that went into it, not just I believe strongly in my stomach that, the, the, the research, the quotations, the balancing what was being done against the, the, the just law theory, and taking a look at the moral and ethical decisions that are being made uh, was, was just phenomenal. So I guess I would close by saying, uh, you know, The Scarlet Letter was a tough book to read. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I, I just, <laughs> I applaud each and every one of you. And if you can do this uh, in your youngster year, the sky's the limit in your second class and your first class year. God bless you all. I, I, I hang my hat and lose all. No one knows me, but they all know Colonel Athens. I'm the little, I'm the little fat old guy who sits next door to him in, in an adjacent office. Come on by any time. I'd love to talk about your paper. Love to talk about anything. And, and Admiral, thanks a lot for uh, giving me another year, an opportunity. Second year of probation, but I'll take it, sir. All right, thank you very much. Hurrah. Thank you, sir. So you can tell that when General Sattler shows up, there's very little energy that comes into the uh, Stockdale Center. But he's serious about that offer to come see him because I've seen tons of midshipmen, many junior officers, many senior officers come in there to, to talk to him about his experience. And he, and he really is a great, a great mentor. So thanks again, sir, for, for sharing those thoughts with us. Um, before we proceed to the awards, Uh, the, the Admiral had introduced all those who, who teach the NE203 uh, moral reasoning course, uh, but, but I do want to recognize one individual who's been at this many years, making this course really what it is, with a lot of support from a lot of good people, but, but he's really the, the, the driver behind it. And uh, Captain Rick Rubel, who I think is right there, who's uh, the Distinguished Military Professor of Ethics, is the course director and uh, just does a marvelous job. So thank you, Rick, for what you do. <clears throat> and I also wanted to mention that uh, the Stockdale Center has, has three resident fellows that come every year to work on the most pressing uh, ethics and, and moral issues of the day for the nation, the military, and, and the academy. And we always invite them to this dinner because they actually show up today. Uh, to start their, start their work, and two of the three are here, and I want to introduce them. The first one is Dr. Alex Chance from uh, Boston College. So if you'd stand up, Alex, we're glad to have you here. And uh, Dr. Scott Davis from the University of Richmond. And our third fellow is Dr. Chris Hill, who's not here with us tonight from the Alexander Hamilton Institute. So we've got a, a real star lineup to, uh, to tackle these issues in the, in the coming year. So it's award time. What we do is, is that, as General Sattler said, there's a whole lot of midshipmen who write these papers. The best papers in each section in the fall and spring semesters of, of this NE203 moral reasoning course Those best papers are then evaluated within the Leadership, Ethics, and Law Department. Those are then narrowed down to five to seven papers for each of the two semesters, fall and, and spring. And then we send them out to uh, neutral readers, folks who are outside of the Naval Academy who can assist us with judging to pick the finalists. And, uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, the individuals who we've had this year to, to do that as our, as our guests Uh, readers. The first one is Vice Admiral Hank Giffen, United States Navy retired, former commander of the Naval Surface Force Atlantic Fleet and currently a vice president for SAIC. And when I was a midshipman, he was one of my lacrosse coaches, which was one of his collateral duties, but that's how I got to know uh, Admiral Giffen. Admiral, thank you for reading for us. Then we actually had a team effort from uh, the Boeing Corporation for their, from their defense, space, and security side of, of Boeing. The Honorable Maureen Cragen, who's the Vice President for Communications, who's sitting right here in the front. And Ms. Joy Arview, who I think is in the back there, who worked together with the Boeing team to read for us. 
And then we had, we had two additional readers who could not be with us tonight. Mr. Robert Kerbeam, Vice President, Integrated Defense Systems from Raytheon Corporation, and Major General Charles Dunlap, United States Air Force, retired, who's the Executive Director on the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security from the Duke University Law School. So we really had a, a great set of individuals to read for us, and we do thank them for that effort. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask General Sattler and, uh, and Admiral Miller to come up here to my right, to, to their left looking up here. And, and I'm going to read the letter that goes with each of the individuals that were finalists uh, and, and then the award winners as well. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the initial one, and then I'm just going to mention the name and the title of the paper of all those after them. So if you're one who gets called, your duty is to come up here so we can get a picture with the three of us with you. Enjoy the round of applause that you will receive, and then go back to your seat. Okay, don't stay up, no. So that's the way we're going to do that. Each of the two winners, one from the fall and one from the spring, uh, what they get extra is, besides this letter of commendation, they, they get a book called Tennessee Patriot, which is uh, about Admiral Lawrence, a fine book about his history. And then they also get a plaque, but they also get money with this. And they'll have to tell you, if you really want to know how much it is, you can ask one of them. But that's what the, what the award winners will receive. So let me start with the fall and start with our first finalist. And this is the letter that each of them will receive from the director of the Stockdale Center Letter of Commendation. I commend you for your outstanding contribution to the ethics essay competition with your paper entitled The Ethical Ramifications of Treating Computers and Networks as Military Targets. This was written by Midshipman Second Class Connor Gear. Your paper was selected by a panel of distinguished experts as a finalist from a field of over 400 entries submitted by students in any 203 during the fall 2012 semester, because we have each of the class half uh, in the fall, half in the spring. Your achievement is a testament to both your academic ability and understanding of the ethical implications of service in the United States Navy and Marine Corps. I applaud your commitment to excellence and appreciate your drive to prepare yourself morally and mentally to lead sailors and Marines. Congratulations and best wishes in all your future endeavors. So Midshipman Second Class, Connor Gear with his paper. Please come up. Another fall finalist is Midshipman Second Class Brian Holloway, his paper, Unmanned Vehicles and Ethical Technology. Midshipman Holloway. This is for Midshipman Second Class Carissa Kleinschmidt, and her paper was Ethics in Military Service. Midshipman Kleinschmidt. So this is our winner for the, uh, for, the, for the fall semester. And again, the Tennessee Patriot book that's received, the plaque, the letter, and money. 
Many of you know I have 10 children, so I always hope I get awards that have money with them. I can always, I can always use those extra, extra dimes, so I know midshipmen can as well. And this is for midshipman second class Bradley Woods, and the, uh, the essay title was Just War Theory and the 2011 Libya Campaign. Bradley? Sir, it is good your mom got a B, though, at least on the... All right, this is for our spring semester. Midshipman second class John Godfrey, the title of his paper, Iran, The Moral Implications of a Preemptive Attack. This is Midshipman Second Class Kirby Mansberger, the title of the paper, Preemptive War with Iran. Popular subject. Come on up. The next one is Midshipman Second Class Andrew Nesselrod, and the title of the paper, The Ethics of a Preemptive War Against Iran. And because there's an honor concept here, they did not copy off of each other. These were independent papers and all very well done. Please come on up. Midshipman Second Class Audrey Petro, the title of her essay, Maintaining Our Ethical Service in Modern Warfare. Next finalist was midshipman second class Jay Thomas. The title of the essay, The Just War Implica Implications of the United States Launching an Attack Against Iran. All right, we got this one down. <laughs> And our winner for the spring semester, midshipman second class Margaret Gilroy with the paper, An Ethical Argument Against Private Military Contractors. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> or at least your replacement on the J-5 staff, who could probably gain a lot from, from reading them. Uh, as we close up tonight, I I'd like to thank my own staff, uh, two that are right over there in the right-hand corner, Marge Bem and Jacqueline Dana. Thank you so much for the organization of the evening and the special touches that you always place on it to, 
to make it just a wonderful night. So Marge and Jacqueline, thank you. And, and as we depart tonight, I, I'd like to leave us with one thought. And uh, it's actually going to close up our night with bookends. And I, I, I did not coordinate this with, with Admiral Miller, but, but I think it's going to be helpful to reiterate something that he mentioned when he opened up our, our evening. The USS William P. Lawrence DDG-110 was commissioned in June of last year. At that commissioning ceremony, Admiral Jim Winnefeld, currently the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of, of Staff, spoke at that commissioning ceremony, but he, he targeted in on the crew and said the following, the USS Lawrence is not only in your hands, she's now in your DNA. Take care of her. And I reflected on the DNA that they inherited from Admiral Lawrence. That DNA included things like courage, competence, integrity, creativity, wisdom, compassion, but maybe his DNA was best captured by, if you look at the shield of the ship, there's a small banner underneath that shield of the USS Lawrence. And it has three words on it, three words that the Admiral mentioned this evening. Never give in. And I think if Admiral Lawrence was here, he would say never give in to fear, never give in to fatigue, never give in to adversity, never give in to injustice, never give in to unethical conduct. So my hope is that this is the DNA we'll carry away with us tonight as well. Never give in. Thank you so much for being with us. It's been a great evening. God bless you all. Have a good night. Thanks.